from your lab visit yesterday and uh, from previous talks, you know how sophisticated the PM in general is. And here we see uh, in this presentation, you'll be going to see different components and uh, how we operate the machine. And so uh, let's start. So starting with a few references, you can consider that uh, as uh, Dr. Rossi told that uh, this Williamson Carter book as a Bible for any PM user who want to be in the field. And the next following four books, one, two, three, four, uh, the Fudge book and DeGraff and Eddington and McLaren, they are really very good for if you're dealing, dealing with uh, material science. And of course, uh, I need to specially emphasize here the Eddington book, it's a bit old, but if you're interested in analyzing the, any defects or uh, diffraction contrast imaging, that book is really very good. And uh, next, if you're looking for a good uh, physical background about the instrument, I strongly recommend uh, go through the Reimer book. And um, the guys from the life science department, a book by Bozolo is really very good uh, because he has uh, written the book just keeping the, uh, in, in the focus about the life science uh, people, uh, how to prepare the samples and all those stuff. And apart from this, they have uh, some specialized books. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see the screen, bottom screen, but I can tell them. Uh, for if you want to understand uh, HRTM, very good. A uh, book by Spence is really good. And a uh, book by Spence and Joe, the electron micro diffraction book is really very good for diffraction analysis. And Egerton book is really good for uh, going through the eel technique. So starting with uh, overview. So a TM in general can, as you know, uh, it can uh, in general be, it can be in high resolution TM or scanning TM or analytical electron microscopy. So exactly high res HRTM means you can observe the unit cell of any crystal lattice and we can do the on the work on that one. But when you say scanning TM mode, it's just like an SCM but with higher spatial resolution. Here we get, we focus the beam uh, very into angstrom size electron beam and we get the information. So when you're working in STEM mode, it's mainly you're working, uh, means your resolution is mainly depend upon the size of the probe that is used in the machine. And analytical, uh, electron microscope means if you start including the X-ray analysis or e uh, yield, then the machine can be can be considered as analytical electron microscope. And uh, based upon this, different voltage levels in general, these PMs are divided as three types. First one, it's a routine uh, instruments which are commonly available in 100 to 200 kV. And uh, next version is the intermediate uh, voltage level that's uh, between 200 and 500 kV. And uh, the third one is a high voltage electron microscope. Uh, I should say nowadays there is not much craze for this high voltage electron microscopes because it leads really very lot of expense. It becomes very expensive uh, for maintaining purpose and uh, it generally creates a nuclear environment. So the craze for this high, high voltage electron microscopes was reduced. And uh, when I'm dealing with the resolution, I will explain more why the the craziness for this HVEM has been reduced. Next, some looking into the some advantages and uh, applications of a general EM. Of course, it can give you micro, uh, microchemical or microstructural uh, potential with supreme resolution. No other instrument in the world can give uh, both of uh, analysis in such a local scale. And apart from that, it can give you structural and chemical information. And uh, when you're doing the analysis, it can give in three different ranges. So starting from atomic scale, you can see the uh, element in nano level, and of course, you can see the particle in the micro, level, micro scale as well. And obviously, you can give atomic resolution where you can see the unit cell. And um, if you do some computer modeling and compare your results with the <coughs> analysis of the uh, images or from, uh, that were obtained from TM, you can extract the quantitative information. But if you want to get the quantitative information, you need to have a lot of experimental details. That, that one you need to keep in mind. And uh, in situ capability, this is a really, uh, I should say, in uh, uh, last 20 years, there is a really very big boom for this in situ uh, capability because there is a good advancement in the TM sample holder. Different uh, sample holders are, are modeled, and uh, now, as you ever, uh, everyone would have heard about this 3D uh, printing. So using the 3D printing, people are starting to generate the uh, very uh, innovative uh, sample holder. 
So this in situ capabilities is really very upcoming research field now in the TM area. Now all these applications doesn't come with a price. It's really very expensive. The basic configuration of a LabTech machine, it's for one EV, it costs five US dollar. And if you consider other options such as bright field detector, dark field detector, high angle under dark field detector, and EDS and other things, it easily can go ten, up to ten dollars per EV. And if you're going for 200 kV electron microscope, it easily costs 200, uh, two million. And um, of course, if you're going for field emission uh, filament, of course, it can uh, go uh, twice the, uh, the cost. So, what exactly it can do means paying that much of money for that one. Why? What is the use of uh, paying that much, and what, what information we can get? About this slide, I can just spend about 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, just uh, explaining all the capabilities of this TM. But I don't want to spend that much, but I'll go very briefly. So main application of a TM, it can be used as a magnifying glass. And, uh, and uh, imaging is the main. That's why it's a 50% covered here. And other 25% uh, is a diffraction. And other uh, is the 25% is the spectroscopy. When you're focusing this imaging, it can be done in TM mode or SM mode. And again, in TM mode, we, can, we have different types of analysis that can be done, such as fresnel imaging, high resolution imaging, and holography. High resolution imaging that's used for understanding the unit cell lattice. Our holography and Lorentz microscopy is mainly used for understanding the magnetic domains. And uh, uh, bright field and <coughs> uh, diffraction contrast imaging that can be used for understanding the defects. And uh, of course, we can add uh, energy filtering to this uh, uh, imaging. And it will be uh, one more dimension for this uh, imaging. And um, the same imaging can be done in scanning TM mode. When you're doing the dealing with the scanning TM mode imaging, we have different type of information, such as we can do bright field and dark field. And we can combine this uh, SEM mode for tomography and perform uh, about 70 degrees, we can rotate the uh, particles and we get the information. And uh, high resolution SEM mode and uh, quantitative head of imaging. And uh, when you're dealing with the diffraction, there are different types. And uh, notably, these are the important types. That's uh, lag bed, means lag bed means large angle convergent beam electron diffraction, convergent beam electron diffraction, uh, large angle character diffraction, and the selected data diffraction, nano beam diffraction. And uh, during our demo classes next uh, tomorrow, I'll try to show some of the images, uh, how the images can be obtained from using a TM. And uh, when you're going for spectroscopy, uh, eels, EDS, and uh, cathode luminescence, and strip eels, and many, can, many things we can do. So um, these, are the, these are the only, means I'm not saying that uh, these are the only techniques that can be done using a TM. There are many more than this, just by changing some parameters and people are coming with the new ideas and coming with the new techniques. So just I want to uh, tell you that we can do a lot of things using a TM. So that's the emphasis of this slide. Next, it's very interesting to see how the uh, TM has been developed. It's not developed in one day or one year or in a couple of years. It's been, it has taken around uh, 80 years or something like that. So, what is the basis for this TM? So first one is, it started in 1897, once J.J. Uh, Thompson has discovered the electron, uh, electrons. Then after that, De Broglie has understood that, or uh, mentioned that the electron has got a dual nature. That is, uh, it's got both particle and wave nature. Next, in 1926, it's a big breakthrough. Here, uh, Hans Busch has um, <coughs> engineered uh, electromagnetic lenses. And based on that, in 1931, uh, the first TM was built by Ernst Ruska and Max Knoll. And in 1938, first ACM and STM were built. And as soon as the TM was built, its resolution was one nanometer, which is much higher than the optical microscope. And in 1968, Albert Crew uh, developed a uh, field emission gun, and with which the uh, resolution was much improved. And uh, for his enormous uh, efforts, in 1986, Ruska has uh, earned his Nobel Prize. And in 1997 and uh, one more day, 198, uh, Ornett Kernak and um, <coughs> someone from Germany, they have uh, they, uh, developed a first aberration uh, uh, character. You can see that it's about, it has taken about 40, 50 years uh, after just uh, developed from one nanometer to uh, 1997 for developing the CS character. 
The reason was principles were known during that time in 1960s the people know about the how to correct the abrasion but due to lack of engineering during those times people were unable to do it but in 1997-98 people first developed the CS corrector and uh, it was a really big, big breakthrough in the electron microscopy. So next, uh, what you, how different the Sorry about that. And uh, so for understanding this uh, TM, I think it's a better, good idea if you compare this microscope TM with the optical microscope. And um, this TM is not much different compared to optical microscope. microscope. So it has got a basis from, uh, it means it, it's developed from optical microscope. So as in the t uh, optical microscope, it has got a light source. We have a light source here. But you have the lenses, and uh, that's a condenser lens. We have the condenser lens. Specimen, of course. And uh, objective lens, we have it. And eyepiece, that's a projector lens. And we have a, you know, for observing the image, we have it something like a detectors. But what is very different compared to optical microscope and TM? First one is the lenses. Here, we use the glass lenses. Here, we have uh, electromagnetic lenses for focusing the electrons. So, and apart from that, is there any difference? Yes, we do have. The main thing is resolution is a very big difference between the optical uh, microscope and uh, TM. So what exactly the resolution means? Resolution, uh, if you look at the de definition, the de ref uh, resolution is defined as the closest distance between two points that can be clearly resolved as a separate entity. And um, for understanding this uh, resolution, you need to go through this Rayleigh criteria. And based on this Rayleigh criteria, we can understand what is the uh, uh, resolution of any entity. So here we can see that it's re mainly resolution is de uh, dependent upon this wavelength, lambda. So uh, based on this, the best uh, resolution that can be obtained using a light microscope is only 200 nanometers. But what about the electrons? So for understanding this, we need to go through some electron properties. So from uh, based on this De Broglie hypothesis, we know that electrons has got dual nature. One is it can act as a uh, particle. And the other one is uh, it can act as a wave. So if you consider this one as a particle, it's got a momentum. And uh, for, uh, do, uh, using that, we can understand that lambda as, uh, is related with the momentum. Then if you consider the electron as a wave, uh, wave characteristics, we can understand that it's, uh, E is equal to EV and M naught V squared by 2. And combining these two properties, we can understand that lambda is uh, expressed using this term. And, uh, its uh, velocity of this electron is almost uh, half of the, or yeah, it's better than uh, velocity of light. So we need to consider the realistic effect. And if you consider here, we, this is the uh, lambda wavelength of the electron, considering the uh, um, realistic effects. Now, what is the, I mean, these are the computed values. With, uh, for 100 kV uh, uh, beams, what are the electron wavelengths for non, considering non-realistic and realistic? And here, you can see that for 200 kV, it's only 0 0.00251 of a nanometer. So it's greater the acceleration. We can see that from the before slide. You can see if you increase the lambda, if you want to increase the lambda, you need to increase the v. Uh, v. So it's uh, inversely proportional. So if you, have, uh, if you want to have a higher resolution, increase the velocity, uh, accelerating voltage. Uh, but <coughs> so. Due to that reason, in 1970s, people started to increase the uh, resolution by increasing uh, accelerating voltage to one, mega, one million electron volts or something like that. But as I said, it increases the cost. And uh, uh, that's why it's very hard to maintain. So they stopped doing that kind of microscopes. And they started building the CS correction or into the microscope. So uh, instead of using a, a one million electron volt microscope, they started to use the only intermediate uh, uh, accelerating voltages, something like 200 and 300, and introduce the CS correction and correct for the uh, obtain a very good resolution. So today, the uh, the best resolution that can be obtained is uh, is published here is 47 picometer, and uh, the theoretical value uh, of the 300 kV is electron beam is 1.2 or 1.3. Still, in practice. There is a lot of work needs to be done, means, and still, 
even though after correcting the aberrations, it is not saying that you know all the aberrations are corrected. We can correct the aberrations still up to a certain point, and still there is a lot of work needs to be done, which we'll be seeing in maybe next week when uh, guys are talking about the aberration character on PM. So next, this is the graph how the resolution has been changed in over years. So as I said, the, as soon as the PM has been invented, it's overcome the resolution of a light microscope, and uh, rapidly from here it started increasing, increasing, increasing. But for decades, it, uh, it remained stagnated for the resolution of one angstrom. The problem was aberrations. Now, there was the, in, 19, uh, in early in 90s, the people have developed the CS correction, and now the resolution is much increased, and now it's 50 picometer is the best, uh, world's best resolution. So, what, uh, it's very interesting to see, uh, I mean, uh, what are the components in the microscope, and it's, this is a second block diagram of a TM, and it's a little bit complicated in our uh, developed compared to the, my earlier version. Here, we see source, and uh, I have put somewhat uh, different condenser lenses, one, two, three, uh, condenser lenses and objective lenses, and um, I put the, some fluorescent screen. So what exactly it means we can divide the TM for understanding much in detail. We can divide the uh, entire TM into four parts. First one is electron source. And the second main component of a TM for understanding it is electron magnetic lenses and the vacuum systems, and the finally, electron detectors. We, if we can understand all these four important parts of a TM, it's really, uh, it's very easy to understand how the TM works and how to analyze, uh, analyze any sample in the TM. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I shouldn't, I'm afraid. Uh, some of the images that we'll be going to show further in this section are already shown by uh, Dr. Rossi, and uh, you can, feel that, you know, uh, I'm, as I'm using it, again means it's really very important. You guys, you need to understand that how it's really important if you want to understand the TM working principle. So first, so <coughs> first one is uh, electron sources. So that's the heart of the TM. And for understanding this electron sources, you need to understand the emission from the electrons. Consider, if you consider any uh, wire with, and uh, if the wire has got uh, electrons passing through the wire, it doesn't flow out of the wire. What is the reason? The reason is the wire has got a positive potential just to hold the, all the electrons into the inside the uh, electron wire, in, in the wire. So same, same principle, if you apply for a pot with the water in that one, when you doesn't apply any heat, nothing, all the water remains in the pot. But if you apply a small bit of heat, it starts boiling and then water comes out. Same principle, it's applicable for this electron emission. So when, we, when, the, uh, when there is no external forces such as heating, all the electrons remain stagnant. But if you apply heat, this, uh, the electrons get splitted and gets out. That's the main principle for this electron emission. And uh, especially, I should emphasize, that is for thermonic emission. So now, here we have four different types of emissions, as you know. That's a thermonic emission. Oh, I should say two. What's a thermonic emission and field emission? Thermonic emission, it's again div divided as uh, from the, can be applied from tungsten filament or lanthanum hexaboride. And uh, the, this hybrid version, the short key, short key uh, emission. And finally, we have uh, cold, cold fed. And here we can see that uh, these arrow marks indicate that when in, the, in case of uh, thermionic emission, it's red, indicates that it's only, it works only on the principle of heat. There is this blue or white. Uh, it indicates that there is no electricity here for thermionic emission. But when you come down here, it it's mainly works on electricity, that's it's a blue, but here it's white, so it indicates there is no uh, thermonic, uh, no, uh, the emission is not just from the thermonic emission. Next, so what is thermonic emission? So just uh, up, working, work function by overcome by thermal, thermal excitations only. I said work function, there is a term called work function, that's a called of applying a heat to the pot in the very simple terms. And in, what is the field emission? Lowering the work function by, uh, by increasing the lifetime of a filament uh, and by both thermal and, uh, and the strong uh, electric field, as in the case of a short key hybrid version, or uh, applying only electric field and producing the emission. Field, uh, uh, that's called uh, field emission. So next, uh, for understanding this uh, thermo, uh, thermionic emitters, it's, uh, this schematic helps a lot. And this schematic is mainly used for thermionic sources. 
and it mainly has got three um, important parts that is filament, venet, anode. Filament is mainly for generating the or uh, heating the uh, filament and getting the electrons. Venet cylinder, it's a, it's a uh, as you know earlier, this is a small, uh, small negative electrostatic lens with a negative potential for it's mainly used for focusing the electrons. And anode, it receives the electrons and the accelerating to the required uh, accelerating voltage, such as 200 or 300. Next, here we have, uh, we need to, for understanding the current density in case of uh, field uh, thermionic emitters, we need to understand uh, since it's mainly given by Richardson's law. And from here we can see that uh, J is directly proportional to uh, work function phi. And, and also, uh, this is a, uh, thermionic emission is done using a tungsten hairpin or lanthanum hexaborate. And here we can see that the shape of the tip is much bigger compared to the shape of the tip in case of a lab six, it's much pointed. So it's, it makes a much difference because if the shape is much bigger, we get the larger um, uh, electron disposition in the sp uh, samples. And when you are comparing the parameters, I can go through that. Now, for case of uh, tungsten filament, it requires a work function of 4.6 eV. But however, for lanthanum hexaborate, for generating a uh, current density of one amp per centimeter square, it requires only 2.1 eV. So, reduced work function, we, and we can extend the lifetime of a uh, filament, and also we can get the better uh, energy resolution. So, next, apart from that, uh, here I try to uh, illustrate what is the importance of a Vennet cylinder. So, Vennet cylinder, it generally signifies the, or it's the main parameter for controlling this brightness. And what exactly the brightness is? It's called uh, current density per unit solid angle. And here, by applying a small negative potential for this Vennet cylinder, we can uh, change the current density here. So, uh, this is the graph here. And when there is uh, no uh, current, uh, we can see that just all the electrons go, just go through and there is no, the brightness is very low here. However, in the other, other extreme the case, here we have the, uh, the electrostatic potential of this Vennet cylinder is maintained at very high. So, all the electrons just bounce back and again we don't have the brightness. And, but here we have, when, when, the electron, uh, when we maintain an intermediate level of uh, electrostatic potential, we get the really very high brightness. So, always uh, inter, uh, we need to maintain an intermediate uh, level for obtaining a higher maximum brightness. But uh, this effect, I, want, I would love to uh, show you guys, but as today's demo is mainly related to the FEG machine, I can't show you this effect. If by chance, if I had an option for to work on a lab six mission, I could have shown this one. Next, for understanding this field emission gun, uh, it's better if you understand the schematics. So, if you compare both the schematics of a, in general, thermionic gun and a field limiter, this Vennet cylinder is different, uh, separated or chain is modified or re taken off and it has been replaced with three different uh, parts such as suppressor, extractor and gun lens. So, what is the function of the suppressor? It's, uh, as we know, the, in the field emission, it requires electric current for producing the electron emission. So, so suppressor, it acts as a, uh, putting a negative, a small negative voltage for putting the, all the electrons onto the optic axis. Now, extractor, the main function of this extractor is to giving the electro electric field to the uh, emission and giving the, uh, 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 initiating the electron emission from this field emission. Now, next, what is the gun lens? For, uh, and this one, it's a just simple to the anode, it can be compared to the anode, and mainly for focusing the electrons and uh, accelerating to the required accelerating voltage. So next, so it, uh, for understanding this Colfax, uh, emission in the Colfax, we need to uh, do it by using the fowler nordim law. The reason is, in this law, we have uh, electricity uh, component, but there is no uh, uh, temperature component. So we need to use this uh, uh, fowler nordim's law for understanding the emission in case of field limiters. And one more thing I need to uh, indicate is, the sh if you see the shape of the tip, here it's only few nanometers, maybe 100 or less than that. So it's really very sharp tip. Due to that, we get a very small energy, energy dispersion, maybe 0.1, I shouldn't say 0.1, I, can, I should say 0.3, and uh, we get really very high brightness. 
And then, of course, on the flip side, what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are it's very expensive and uh, high, uh, it requires really very high vacuum environment. So um, even though if you have a really very high vacuum, it needs a kind of kind of flashing. It means that the kind of uh, spark giving a little, uh, short spark to the filament and taking off all the filament, uh, contamination on the filament. So it needs to be done every eight hours of use. So it's uh, complicated, but we have really very good advantages using the cold effect. Next is the uh, short key, uh, short key uh, emitter. It's a, as I said, it's a hybrid version of both uh, thermionic and uh, field emission. Here we have, uh, again, we have the tip is really very sharp enough as in the case of uh, cold effect, but uh, we reduce the work function by introducing a zirconium oxide coating. And uh, so means uh, here we use the uh, uh, temperature controlled as well. So the main feature of this is, of course, we get a good uh, small energy dispersion, but it's not as high as a cold effect. It's manageable and a high brightness as it is a fag machine. And um, it's, uh, it doesn't require any flashing. That's really good. And it can be stable for over a lot of time. Now, uh, just to compare all the parameters, uh, I believe you have seen this uh, table before as well. And um, first, work function. In case of this tungsten and uh, fag, machine, fag filament, they both require a really lot of uh, big uh, work function, 4.5, 4.5. But if you see the temperature, it's the, temp uh, the tungsten requires 2,700 uh, Kelvin. But it requires only 300. That's maintained at a room temperature. So that's a, that's the reason why we, it has got a um, cold effect. And next, the current density here it's really very good. It's about 10 to 6 amps per meter square, which is excellent. And uh, the fag machine, as uh, the short, short key also, it's not that bad. And it's we're getting 10 to 5. And the radius, it's really uh, the fag is uh, dominant here. It means the radius is very very small. And normally they are manufactured using the uh, focus ion beams. Uh, and uh, the crossover is again, it's very small. It's 2.5, we can get it. And the brightness, it's really excellent, 10 power 13. And uh, the stable, stability, it's really good, but uh, it, it can be for five hours. And of course, the, the filament, the vacuum, it requires a really very high vacuum. And uh, it pays off the, the price, it means it gives the benefit of giving, uh, extending the life as for over 5,000 5, hours. So next important part is the electromagnetic lenses. You need to understand this. It's really because all the, electro, uh, all the lenses in a TM is, are made of uh, these electromagnetic lenses. So for understanding this, just we need to go through some physics. Uh, from your high school physics or from your graduate physics, you know that uh, how the electron behaves in a magnetic field. If a, when an electron is in magnetic uh, field, it can experience a Lorentz force, and uh, uh, Lorentz force is given by the uh, cross product of velocity and magnetic field induction. And and also the rotate uh, when the uh, particle is moving, our uh, body is moving from the centripetal force. We can see we can know that uh, it's a mass times of square um, mv square by r. So from this one, the radius is equal to mv by d. Based on these two equations, we can extract this. Conclusions. So, first one is if velocity is parallel to the uh, magnetic field induction, then there is no uh, force on the electrons. Next one is if the electrons are not parallel, that is perpendicular or in any other orientation, we, there is a uh, the electrons rotate in a helical motion with respect to radius r along the b. And we do this step. Uh, we check when you're doing the TM alignment, uh, especially we check with this. Uh, uh, we make sure that all the electrons are circulating around the optic axis, and we check this alignment step really very frequently. And especially if you're doing any high resolution imaging, we need to check this one, very important. And uh, how to do that one? I can, I'll be discussing that one in further slides. Next, uh, one more important point is, if the magnetic field is homogeneous, then the focusing action is just like a, uh, obtain the one which we can obtain using a lens. And the focal length depends upon the magnetic field induction, that is, lower the B, higher the focal length, and also, the, the lenses that are used in the TM are rotational symmetric magnetic lenses. So next, uh, these are the two types of uh, electromagnetic lenses that are used. This is a uh, uh, winding. It's iron winding and is with a, a hole. And the, by circulating a current, electric current through this coil or windings, 
we generate the magnetic field at this gaps or this po uh, focus points that's called pole peaks and uh, by that we control the focusing uh, uh, action of uh, electron beam and here the for these are the main important parts of this electron lens that's pole piece that metal cones that shapes and concentrate the magnetic field and bore that's the this one and a hole drilled through the uh, center of the lenses and the gap that's a gap is these are the, uh, the distance between the two pole piece and when you're designing any electromagnetic lenses in a computer modeling these two are really very important parameters bore and gap uh, the ratio between the bore and gap ratio and the coil and windings the copper wire for creating a magnetic field and of course when you're generating I means when you're translating I means when you're putting a lot of electricity it generates a lot of heat and we need to have water cooling system for reducing the temperature of the coil next uh, i think it this is a good point to show that uh, just quickly show the operations uh, that means as in the case of uh, uh, glass lenses we have uh, operations in the uh, electromagnetic lenses as well and i'll be showing uh, i'll be talking about okay, quickly talking about three different uh, operations that is uh, astigmatism spherical and chromatic and all these uh, three operations it mainly shares one single property that is electrons running off axis through the lens are, are wrongly deflected so if you are uh, look into the spherical aberration the electrons that are away from the optic axis are focused far and the, the uh, this is the optic axis the electrons that are uh, traveling away from the optic axis they are uh, focused far and the electrons that are really nearby to the optic axis they are i mean vice versa so that's the problem with the aberration correction aberration uh, spherical aberration and uh, the, when you are dealing with the chromatic aberration it's mainly related to the energy of the electron beam and uh, it can be uh, spherical aberration can be minimized use, maybe using apertures up to certain extent but you can't eliminate it maybe if you use the corrector we can reduce it uh, really very much higher and uh, chrom uh, chromatic aberration it can be minimized maybe by using a monochromator next uh, astigmatism this astigmatism is the simplest one of all these three and this is mainly caused due to the non uniformity in the magnetic lenses and normally this is corrected by using a called a stigmator called a stigmator and uh, maybe when you're dealing with the demo class i'll show you the how to correct this stigmatism uh, next the thing is the vacuum systems this is really very important because the why means what is the reason why we need to have a vacuum in the tm uh, first one is electrons should avoid collision with air molecules inside the vacuum if electrons uh, collide with a um, carbon uh, hydrocarbon molecule gas molecule it forms a hydrocarbon uh, contamination in the column which is not good so the electron should uh, that uh, we need to avoid that collision that's the first reason now the second reason is the when you are heating the filament it shouldn't just I miss mean, if you're heating the filament in a normal air conditions it just burns off so if you if you want to extend its right uh, life or uh, for uh, for any other such reasons it needs to be the heating of filament should be done in a highly vacuum uh, environment now next one is just for as a reason uh, explained before the tip of the cathode should not be rounded off it is we need to always we need to get the electrons from a really very sharp end of a filament so if you are uh, <coughs> uh, heating the filament in a uh, not good vacuum then the tip will become round off and we are, we are the, due to that we are increasing the energy spread in the microscope which is not a good feature so we need to have a good vacuum for that as well and the electron gun should be a good voltage proof and specimen should not contaminate just as i uh, explained before if the specimen has got a lot of uh, I mean, uh, gas molecules on it and when the electron beam focuses on it and it, it uh, make a reaction and forms the hydrocarbons over the sample so we need to avoid that one and uh, in the for the slides i'll show you how we can uh, eliminate uh, this uh, contamination or not eliminate or reduce the contamination so <coughs> in the case of this vacuum level there are some particular te uh, terminology it's a standard it's not really standard just for explanation i have used it so up to 10 power minus 4 we can consider as a uh, lv that's a low vacuum or from up to 10 power 6 it can be considered as a high vacuum and beyond 10 power minus 6 or minus 5 it can be considered as a ultra high vacuum and here uh, there is something has written here i'm not saying that if you're maintaining a good high vacuum it doesn't mean that we don't have any uh, contamination 
So if you see the level of contamination formation, if your vaccine level is 10 to minus 5 for forming one monolayer of contamination, it takes about one minute. But if the uh, vacuum level is the tempo minus eight pascals, that's much higher vacuum. The level uh, the, for forming one monolayer of this contamination, it takes about seven uh, seven hours. So that's a really good thing. Means always we need to main check for the machine. We need to have a really very high vacuum. Next, this is the uh, vacuum layout. How the, in the in a general TM, this is the part where uh, it's an like electron gun, as uh, Dr. Risi mentioned. Elcon gun is always in the uh, maintain a very high vacuum because it shouldn't burn away the filament, and the column in, is gen, in general is maintained at a high vacuum, and uh, observatory channel that is uh, detectors and uh, CCD also it's maintained at a high vacuum. Just to support the high vacuum, there is a uh, low vacuum is there, and this uh, these criteria low vacuum, high vacuum, and ultra high vacuum, they are obtained from different using different types of equipment such as first one is the rotary pump. It's a rotary pump can be considered as better version of a vacuum pump. So here we just suck the air, exit the air. That's really very basic, simple principle. And turbo molecular pump, it mainly works on a turbine's shaft that are rotating really very fast. And due to the Brownian motion, it takes off the, the gas molecule. And uh, the turbo molecular pump itself, it can go uh, to 10, it's, which is capable of giving you a really very high vacuum environment. And, of course, and there are two others, uh, that is the ion getter or oil diffusion pump. And these two are kind of storage pumps. So what I, when I say storage pumps means it, it doesn't work, uh, it can't work independently. It needs the support from uh, other pumps. And then it can, from that point, it can in increase the vacuum level. And um, here we, we can see how these vacuum pumps work. And first, as I said, the rotary pump just is really very simple. and. Uh, it's dirty and it's not good, but it, it is required for doing, giving a, a good initial pickup. Next, the turbo molecular pump. It, there are uh, many shafts are there. Uh, when there is a, uh, it works, the shafts will be rotating very fast and the vacuum will be squeezed to the bottom and it just excess it. Next, the uh, uh, oil diffusion and then uh, iron getter. These both mainly works on the same principle. That is. Gas molecules are ionized and are spiraled into the magnetic field and eventually uh, get buried into the gas, the cathodes. So here the, we use a special oil for heating the, for uh, special oil and make sure that, that oil reacts with the gas molecules and it's been uh, extracted. But uh, in case of uh, uh, iron getter, there is no such oil or nothing. Just by heating the filament and uh, uh, we take out the gases. So it's much cleaner uh, vacuum can be expected using the iron getter. Next, um, when you say something, uh, it's in the uh, ultra high vacuum or a high vacuum or low vacuum, how we can understand? We need to measure it. So for measuring the uh, vacuum systems, we have two different types of gauges. That's a Pirani gauge and Penning gauge. And Pirani is mainly used for uh, low vacuum cases. And here, the Pirani gauge is mainly working as a heat the tungsten filament and then uh, we put into the vacuum, and if the tungsten filament the, uh, heat is changed, that change in heat is converted into vacuum, and the vacuum is measured. And our in the penning uh, penning gauge, it works just like an ion gauge, but uh, it's uh, and it's mainly used for measuring the higher vacuum uh, environment. So next fi uh, final component of this is uh, electron detectors, and here uh, now for. Understanding these electron detectors, we once after the uh, electron beam passes through the specimen, we get the electron beam out. So how we can see that? So for uh, our, we can't see the electrons with our naked eyes. We need to do something. The main process behind this converting these electrons to light is called cathode illuminescence. It's a process of converting the energy of light to process uh, produce the light. So when the whenever the electron beam hits a semiconductor. Uh, kind of the, uh, due to the conduction band from, uh, to the exception of electron from valency band to conduction band, we get the light and based on that, it is possible to see the electrons. So we have, uh, it's this uh, uh, schematics shows the parts just behind the, below the projector lens. And uh, we have two types, that's a fluorescent screen, which is coated with zinc sulfide, uh, it's a luminescence. And uh, of course, and it is being enclosed in a lead glass 
to just to avoid uh, x-rays that are coming from the screen. And uh, this one is much convenient to see and we can see the contrast in, of the images really very good. But unfortunately, we can't do any quantification on this, uh, the images that were seen on the fluorescent screen. So we need to have further extension such as uh, CCD. Uh, it, this is the best uh, option for doing uh, quantification or get, recording the images. Before going to talk about something about this CCD, we'll see what are the different other ways before the guys were using it. First, as soon as the TM was introduced, the people were uh, started using these photographic plates. They are generally means uh, old fashioned and uh, the problem with that one is it is a limited dynamic range. The, the contrast in the colors is really very limited if you are using the photographic plates. But uh, unfortunately, they are, they are, that is the technique that was there when as soon as the TM was introduced. And next one is the imaging plates. This was introduced in 1990s by Fujifilm and it's really much breakthrough advance, but uh, it can offer really very good dynamic range and requires uh, no chemicals for developing the photograph, but um, it's the, the problems with this one are, it's a delay in the seeing the data because you can't see after getting a recording an image, we can't see directly the image. It needs to be uh, go through some kind of special uh, scanner and then it needs to be put into the uh, computer. Then we can do the, all the requirements. So this is not a really viable option. So next, this is the very, very good option that is a CCD. And uh, it was being in, introduced only 15, 20 years back, I guess. Next, uh, it, it is available in uh, three different sizes or more than that, I guess. Um, commonly used sizes are 1K, 2K, and 4K cameras. And uh, uh, mainly it has got three uh, parts. That is the scintillator, fiber optics, and of, co of course, now before the one uh, when it, they are introduced, we have optic couple as well, but now they are not using it. But uh, we have the CCD chip. For, uh, the scintillator just uh, converts the electron to light, and the fiber optics that transmits the light to the CCD. And the CCD, it's a kind of a, uh, parallel and serial register of uh, uh, detecting the intensity of light. And uh, of course, now there is a good advancement here, and um, the, there is, that is called a direct detection cameras. This, in this direct detection cameras, they are invented only in, or, or into the market only one year or two years back. And here, in, the, in case of the direct detector, they eliminate both this scintillator and the fiber optics. So we get the, re, uh, the images are really very good, good resolution uh, because the, there won't be any, not much noise or the noise level will be much reduced compared to the CCD. Next, there are a few other components as well. That's the call, that's call stage. The stage is a really important one because uh, the ideal stage needs to be we are able to manipulate or navigate the whole over the sample. So we need to, we are able to, uh, good stage is always, we are able to go in X and Y the direction. And uh, we need to maintain a good eccentric height. Uh, eccentric height means when you tilt the sample, there, is, there won't be any uh, movement in the sample portion. So we need to offer a good eccentric height uh, conditions and uh, able to tilt the sample for different orientations, uh, different axis. And, uh, so it is a positive, we need to do able to do the course on low magnification or high magnification. Especially, there should be a good stability when you are acquiring a high high magnification images, because if the, an image is acquired at a one million uh, magnification and with a drift of 0.1 nanometer, and if you are uh, exposing the film or image for one second, then it can give you a motion blur of 0.1 millimeter of a motion blur. So the ideal stage it needs to be really very stable. And it, it needs to be, uh, be good. we need to get good images at very, when you're focusing the, or obtaining images at very high magnification. Next, it needs to be avoid any drift, as I said. The need, no need to, uh, need to be highly stable by avoiding drift and vibrations during image exposure time. Next, uh, the, as I said earlier only, this, uh, there are, there is a really, this field is really ongoing and high, high uh, interest research field here. And okay, the, the specimen holders, uh, in the TMs that were invented before, we used to have two options. That is the top entry uh, holders and the uh, side entry holders. Top entry, it's just it's a cartridge based uh, holders. They are just, we insert the sample and drop into the cartridge into the, uh, the column and leave it. Uh, because of that, we get a really good high resolution images. But uh, on the flip side, if we can't rotate the, um, the specimen to a very high angle, angle such as more than 10 degrees or 12 degrees. So that's not really uh, good enough for doing any analytical work or tilting or diffraction analysis. So 
the side entry uh, holders are really very, very versatile because they can give uh, stable conditions and they can tilt the sample and we can get them, uh, we can do a lot of things such as tomography and, or tilting the sample from one zone axis or the zone axis such as like this. Now, uh, if you see the schematics of a general TM uh, uh, holder, it's got uh, two important parts. That is the O-ring and the pin. Always this O-ring needs to be really very clean because uh, they go in contact with the vacuum system. If there is any dust here in this O-ring, it will go in contact and it will contaminate the vacuum system. So uh, when you are working in our laboratory, we ask or strongly advise the people to be, uh, take extra care for cleaning these O-rings. And uh, this guide pane, using this guide pane, we can put the sample, uh, insert the sample into the column. And uh, two, these are the two common types of uh, holders that are available in most of the laboratories. That's a single tilt, which can offer in a tilt in one direction. And a double tilt, we can offer in two directions, y, x, and y. And besides that, there are different types of holders, such as uh, beryllium holder. This holder is uh, especially useful for when you're doing EDS because the, of the beryllium, it gives a low background and it's really very good. And we can, uh, some holders are there, if you want to do any uh, cooling uh, means analysis at a minus means cold re temperatures, it's a, a, a liquid nitrogen cooled uh, holder. And then uh, there is a different form that is a tilt and rotate holder. This, uh, this is very good if you're working with a diffraction analysis because here we can tilt, by seeing the sa sample, we can tilt for a low, very large area. And we, uh, we, if there is a movement in the sample, we can re uh, easily identify that movement. And there is a multiple sample holder. Using this, once if you insert the sample, we can look for five samples at a time. So it's very really easy because taking out and inserting the sample, it takes about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So you don't waste the time. And uh, there is a tomography holder. and. Uh, there is a one more heating experiment which can go up to uh, 1,300 degrees centigrade. And uh, so these are not the limited cases. Still, we can, there are many other different types of uh, TM holders. So next, up, uh, apart from this one, we have different apertures. Uh, these uh, the apertures are mainly for you know, controlling the resolution or setting the image conditions or for setting the collection angle and uh, convergence angle. So first one is the condenser aperture, which is just beneath the condenser, so the name condenser aperture. And uh, limits the uh, number of electrons uh, hitting the sample. That's a, that is the setting of, of the illumination condition. And it's, um, next one is the object aperture. Ju this is just beneath the object lens. And uh, mainly this is used for doing the diffraction contrast imaging. And uh, selected area aperture, that's uh, as in the name suggests, this is for selecting a particular region and getting the information, and it's just beneath the back focal plane of the object lens. So this is the cross section. This is the third part here. Uh, means as today's afternoon demo is considered with the GOL 2100 FTM. So I take on this cross section of this, and uh, here we see means it has got many different lenses. So a number of uh, one, three condenser lenses, two or three condenser lenses, and uh, uh, d different object lenses, and uh, many. Uh, intermediate lenses and projector lenses and the, the viewing screen. So I, for understanding this, I just first I simplified it as uh, electron gun, condenser lens system, aperture, uh, objective lens, objective lens, aperture, selected area aperture, projector lens, and uh, observatory system. And uh, there is a back, if you are observed in the yesterday's uh, demo or tour to the LME, the vacuum system stays in the back. And here we have the liquid nitrogen. We fill that one for uh, avoiding the, any much contamination or uh, reducing the heat in the column. So next, for understanding this, I have used this schematic such as uh, I developed, means I have given this, uh, simplified this the block diagram as using a diffraction unit. So uh, this condenser lens system is uh, replaced with a diffraction unit and uh, uh, this entire system is replaced with one lens as you see in the optical microscope. and. Uh, so there are mainly one, two, three of the deflection units. In case the, okay, next, okay. Uh, for understanding this operation of this microscope, we normally do it in five steps. First, that is uh, condensed aperture alignment. Next, electron gun alignment. Next, setting the eccentric height, setting the pivotal point, and the rotation center alignment. If you have able to do all these five steps, you can be confident that uh, the TM is aligned for working, uh, working through. 
So first, uh, uh, means you need to means I have I haven't spoken anything about this TM illumination system. It can be operated in TM that is uh, parallel beam mode or in the focused silicon beam. So when you are especially working within a TM mode, it can have a very wide range of uh, parallel beam. So it's a parallel. So uh, in these two cases are mainly used for TM, and these two last two are for use in seabed mode or in a, a scanning TM mode. And this is uh, the, uh, it has got a dual lens, two lenses. That's the first one is condenser lens one and condenser lens two. Condenser lens one determines the spot size, size of the spot that can be used for the analysis. And the condenser lens two, that is commonly uh, manipulated using the brightness knob on the TM control. Uh, this is mainly used for uh, illumination purpose, uh, whether it should be a uh, open uh, parallel beam or focused spot mode. And uh, there is a one called aperture, which is used for setting the convergence angle. Next. Uh, in case if you don't understand any of these schematics, please don't be worried because uh, I will be using the same uh, slides for the demo in the afternoon, and we can work through all uh, exactly same uh, using same things. So, for first step, the alignment process is condenser ap aperture alignment. When the machine is not aligned, it's in the misaligned state. We can expect that it's in the, something like this. So the beam is filtered away from the optic axis. And when you change the C2 aperture, C2 lens, that is, use it, if you change the increase the brightness knob, the beam will be going just away from the center. That is, the beam the, is not concentric in nature. So that's the mis that indicates the machine is in uh, misaligned state. So first, if you want to align that machine, first we need to shift using the deflection unit. We shift the beam uh, to the center, and uh, for the focus of beam. And when you are in the step three, and if you are open. Still, there is no use because still we haven't adjusted the condenser aperture here. So next, we have we adjust the condenser aperture to the center of the. This is the optic axis, the line in the, in the center, and we adjust the uh, condenser aperture to the center. Then, when you do that, the 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 focused beam will be going away, and we focus that by using a deflection unit one. That's a beam tilt. Then. Now, when we open the beam, then we can see that uh, the beam will be uh, have opening and contracting and uh, extracting uh, uh, uniformly in a concentric manner. So that indicates the uh, successful condenser uh, aperture alignment. Next, this uh, this is how we do it on a real TM. Uh, that's a TM 25. Here I have shown uh, left control panel and right control panel. The is nothing really very. Uh, um, Important because as this panel is sitting next to the right left side of the uh, column, we uh, we call it as a left control panel, and as this uh, panel is sitting right side of the control panel, we say it as a right control panel, and um, using this brightness and this uh, knob, we can correct the, the condenser lens aperture alignment, and uh, when you're in TM mode, we have options for three different um, increasing the convergence angles, say one, two, three. Here, uh, this is uh, set by alpha angle. This alpha angle is nothing but it's a predefined uh, convergence angle by the jewel. And uh, when you're working uh, in uh, TM mode, we have three uh, convergence angles. And uh, of course, when you're working in EDS mode, that's just focusing the spot and getting the yield spectrum. There, we have uh, five options, but they are extreme end. So, and uh, other one is in the embed mode, that's a nano beam diffraction mode. We have five diffraction, five modes again, but in the lower end. And uh, when you are working in a convergent beam diffraction, we have a total of nine from starting uh, very small to very big. All everything is covered in the nine. And of course, when you're doing the seabed mode, we need to have, uh, depending upon the experiment, in some cases we need to have very low convergence angle, and in some cases we need to have very high convergence angle. So it, it is dependent upon the experiment of the seabed mode. We need to use the one or nine. So, <coughs> next is the next step of alignment is uh, electron gun alignment. Here, this slide was pre prepared just for doing for uh, for um, lab six machine because we, if when you take a uh, profile, it needs to have a it needs to be in the center and it needs to have a high uh, intensity. But when you're working with the FEG machine, it's slightly different. But of course, we can understand it. Uh, <coughs> Here, in this case, the beam, uh, the electron gun is tilted, and the beam is shifted. And here, the beam is also shifted. 
So we correct using but deflection one and two. So uh, when you are working on a FEG machine, we try to correct it using both deflection in uh, gun tilt, gun shift. And uh, when you are working on an MSC machine, that is a lat six machine, we try to get uh, higher maximum uh, intensity of uh, electron beam. So next, the, how this can be done in a uh, microscope? Uh, as I said, here use the gun tilt to maximize the beam in the lat six machine. And uh, using uh, uh, when we are working with the FEG machine, it's slightly different. We need to center the anode obler in the FEG machine, and we need to maximize it. Now, and also we need to center the beams for different spot sizes. So this is a kind of uh, common for both the uh, microscopes. But this step, gun tilt adjustment, is slightly different for FEG machine and uh, lab six machine. And uh, here, this for understanding this uh, different spot sizes, it's a kind of we need to perform cyclically. So that is uh, change the spot size from one to five. That's a one is the biggest spot and five is the smallest spot. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, there is no movement when you change the spot, uh, size of the spots. And we can, I can demonstrate this one when you are working on the demo session in the afternoon. Next, once after finishing the gun tilt, it's a good idea to uh, correct this for the astigmatism. Uh, so this is uh, the, uh, this uh, image shows the influence of a highly astigmatic beam, and we we correct this one using a stigmatus. Uh, and we generally do it, uh, or it means okay. In this this technique, this method, we have means I have shown this uh, images that were acquired using from lat six machine. But when you are acquired from the fag machine, uh, we try to get the, the in, uh, image of the source at very high magnification and try to make it as a equilateral triangle. Again, I'll show you that one in the demo session. Next, eucentric height. Setting the eucentric height. This is really very important. And whenever you are working with a machine. We need to check this uh, uh, step of alignment very often. What exactly is the eucentric height means? Uh, when when a specimen is in at a eucentric height, or if you tilt the sample, there is no movement. So in these three cases, the specimen uh, when you, this is uh, when this is a specimen. If you tilt the sample, the uh, the, uh, the specimen is trying to move uh, move away from the optic axis. So this is a misaligned state. And here, this is the specimen is in the eucentric height. So even though if you tilt in this direction, middle, or in this direction, the specimen is remaining in the entire in the same position. And uh, when you're this one is really very important. Again, uh, I will be doing it. And uh, how we can do it on the TMS just by oval the. We can do it in two steps. First, force adjustment and fine adjustment. Force adjustment is just uh, increase the z height and uh, uh, observe this kind of uh, effect, such as. Uh, when you are in an under focus mode, we see a bright fringe outside the particle or, or edge of a carbon film. And uh, if you are in in focus, the contrast is really very low. And if you are over focus, there is a black fringe outside it. So this indicates we are in a, under which condition we are in. And uh, after once after reaching a, after performing this course adjustment, we can do the fine adjustment using a, a obli, a, a image obler and minimize the movement of the image. Using the Z control, so we need to do the, repeat this uh, this step whenever you change the magnification, or especially if you are doing the high resolution imaging, you need to do this one very often. Next, pivotal point. So uh, in your uh, TM, for means there is uh, no case. In, means most of the time, means ideal case is this is the one. So this is a pivot point. The, the area on the top from here to here. Is same as from here to here. It, this point acts as a pivotal point, but most of the cases in TM, uh, it won't be like this. So because if you want to do any diffraction contrast imaging, or if you tilt the sample, or if you tilt for any other reasons, the beam is slightly tilted. So in that case, or if you change the height as well, the beam is slightly tilted. So we need to check for the pivotal point. It, this one, uh, the main reason for this pivotal point is. The region above the pivotal point, or illumination above the pivotal point, is same as the illumination below the pivotal point. So that's the main idea of this uh, checking for this pivotal point. And here we can uh, correct it by using the. This is the way. When the pivotal point is not correct, it just image will be moving very badly, and we need to uh, reduce that moment, uh, moment by changing the super, uh, operations using the deflection unit one, two and three, because this is the, the place where the sample is kept. We need to change both of them, and we need to uh, minimize that movement. And when you come to the original operation of the TM, this is slightly done differently. Uh, use a tilt for 
uh, using in when you are in imaging mode, we use the uh, tilt compensator for minimizing this movement. And when you are in diffraction mode, we use the shift compensator and we, need, we reduce the moment. Uh, I think uh, it's better if, if I show you on the, in the demo, it will be good. Next, this uh, rotation centering alignment. In the, when I am dealing with electromagnetic lenses, I mentioned that uh, the, due to the, the electrons in a magnetic field, they go around a, spiral, a spherical direction. Always we need to check for this alignment and uh, the, uh, make sure that all the electrons are, uh, are the electron beam is in the one uni, uh, um, optic axis. So uh, this is really very, very important step. And of course, this is the last step and it's really important. And uh, again, uh, both these steps, this uh, eccentric height and this uh, rotation center alignment, you need to check very often when you're, whenever you're doing a high resolution imaging or normal imaging as well. So uh, next, the, how it can be done? We can do this uh, rotation centering alignment using voltage centering or current centering. Means voltage centering means over, uh, just over the high tension and make sure that uh, image is not moving or image is moving, but it's in the it's, uh, in the kind of like this up and down. But it's the uh, same thing if uh, we are, when you're doing, you can do that one in the current uh, centering mode. That uh, change the current across the objective lens and make sure that uh, the image is obeying uh, exactly in the center of the optic axis. And this is very, uh, as I said, this is really very vital for finding uh, reliable and accurate high resolution information. Next, once after finishing this, uh, this is uh, objective lens astigmatism correction. Uh, this is very, uh, this is very easy to see this kind of image or uh, correction if there is a large bit of amorphous region on the sample. Uh, of course, uh, every sample has got some, some bit of amorphous, but if the sample has got really a uh, lot of carbon or something like that, it's very easy to do it. And we need to make sure, and this is the FFT of a carbon um, image, and uh, under focus mode and in focus and over focus mode, and we, when you are in the three different modes, we need to make sure the, the circle, we need to make the beam as, as circular as possible. Maybe I will try to show this one uh, when you're doing a demo session. Next, what is the role of this objective aperture? So uh, the first main role of this objective aperture is the, we can do the diffraction contrast imaging. So first, in the, we, uh, we can put the objective aperture in the, exactly in the center of the optic axis, and we can do the, just we can uh, eliminate the diffracted electrons, and just we, we make sure that all the electrons are from the transmitted beam, and doing that in such a way, we can enhance the uh, contrast in the image. So you can see here, with the, this is the image that has taken without the aperture, and this is the image that has taken with the aperture. You can see that the, there is a really lot of uh, contrast enhancement here. And um, this is uh, vital if you're looking for you know, nanoparticles for, uh, because nanoparticles doesn't appear very, means the size of the nanoparticles are really very small. It's very hard to see. Maybe if you use the objective aperture and uh, perform a bright field imaging, it's really easy to see them. Next version is the uh, dark field imaging. This is, uh, this can be normally done in two different ways. There is the aperture centered dark field imaging and uh, uh, centered, uh, no, displaced aperture uh, dark field imaging and uh, character centered dark field imaging. Uh, in the olden days, the people used to say this uh, displaced aperture dark field is a poor man's image because the, ima uh, the microscope that were built in 1960s or 70s, they got a lot of uh, astigmatism or the, uh, aberrations in the uh, lenses. So due to that, there, we can see really very good of aberrations in the image. But the instruments which we use today, uh, they have uh, abrasion as, as one millimeter or something like that. So it doesn't matter that much if you're using a centered aperture or uh, this one, the centered aperture or corrected uh, dark field imaging. Here we tilt the sample uh, beam by using a tilt controls and we centered the beam to the, in the optic axis and we acquired the image. Doing this way, it's a little bit tricky because uh, moving, uh, tilting the sample, uh, the beam to the optic axis because it will be changing the imaging condition, the illumination conditions on the sample. So I suggest maybe if it's better if you use this, uh, this process because just insert the aperture and get the uh, image. Uh, means insert the aperture for the diffracted beam, diffracted electrons and get the image. It's much simpler. And uh, due, to, I mean, due to low operations in the uh, existing PMs, it doesn't uh, matter much. Next, uh, selected area aperture. Using this aperture, we perform the selected area diffraction. That is, we select a particular region on the sample and we get the diffraction and we acquire it. And as the name, uh, this 
aperture also called as the field limiting aperture as it limits the field. And finally, the scanning TM mode and here <coughs> scanning TM mode here the most of the time the it is mainly dependent upon the, the lenses that are placed above the samples because the uh, the once the means setting up the imaging conditions is the main crucial thing in the scan when you're working with the scanning TM mode because the just after passing the uh, below the samples the for getting these uh, stem images we don't have any uh, the images are not formed by lenses they are formed by the detectors so it's really much uh, much efficient way of uh, getting the images and here we can uh, based upon the collection angles we can get, we get different modes so if there is a no color means if in the center a region we get the bright field images these bright field images are just common as in the seen in the tm bright field images and if the collection angle is little bit higher uh, we can get the dark field images here we get the good contrast in the images and uh, and re, and the, if the collection angle below the sample here if the if the, if the collection angle is rich be, be really very high we get the <coughs> highly scattered uh, images that called high angle annular dark field images and these images are really very interesting because the, the contrast in this image is mainly depend upon the atomic number so this is really very good imaging technique next there are some other attachments uh, linked to this tm uh, by Putting the uh, EDS detector just above the samples, we can perform a e, uh, EDS uh, X-ray energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, or we can by collecting the uh, in, uh, inelastic electrons below the sample below the column, we can uh, perform the yields spectro yields analysis. For using both these techniques, we can do line scan uh, mapping, area mapping, and point analysis. Uh, of course, uh, there is a um, uh, very comparative differences between these two techniques. And you'll be hearing more in this uh, coming few weeks. Next, uh, how the contamination uh, affects uh, what are, I mean, how a contamination can form in a TEM. So there, mainly there are uh, two ways how the contamination can uh, happen. That is, one is in the TEM mode, other one is in uh, STEM mode. The principle is a little bit different because here the, the beam is much bigger in the, when you are in the TEM mode. So the contamination occurs due to the interaction of electrons with a closely spaced CH molecule, that is a uh, carbon hydro mo molecule, and forming solid CH molecule. But however, when you're in a uh, stem mode, here the occurrence due to the interaction of electrons with a CH molecule and a surface diffusion as well. The surface diffusion effect comes into the uh, stem mode when you're working in the stem mode. So how do uh, the electron beam, uh, and also uh, when, once a contamination is formed, it forms on the top and bottom of the surface. Of course, uh, this is, I mean, if you think, in a, if you see this as a uh, positive uh, site, we can measure a thickness using the contamination as well. And, but uh, of course, it will be, uh, you know, destroying your sample. And, uh, and how to, um, but uh, generally, I don't prefer uh, measuring the thickness using the contamination. Uh, I, recommend, I strongly recommend it, don't, don't do it. And uh, how to reduce this contamination, uh, maybe, Use a liquid nitrogen uh, dever fill a uh, very I mean, cyclic in you know every five hours time. You need to fill it with a liquid nitrogen dever and clean samples. The cleaning is needs to be done using a plasma cleaner, and we need to maintain uh, have a look or have an eye on the vacuum vacuum levels. If you have a really very bad vacuums, try not to do any analysis that day. Next, here finally the energy uh, the room uh, design. As a TM user, uh, most of the things you can't do anything, but there are a few small bits which you can do for getting a good uh, images in your TM. So first one is vibration. Vibration is, vibrations are the main cause if you're working in a high resolution environment. We need to maintain the lower vibrations and they can occur for different reasons, that is acoustic noise or mechanical. And acoustic noise, the, uh, that can be occur from machinery or air conditioning system. As a user, you can't do any of anything or anything, but as a user, you can uh, eliminate the noise. Means uh, when you're acquiring any high resolution images, don't make any noise. Means moving your chairs or talking with someone or uh, keep your cell phones away from the column or something like that. Uh, those small things, but it matters a lot when you're doing acquiring a high resolution images. Then mechanical uh, vibrations. Again, as a user, you can't do anything, but just for your information's sake, I'm giving here. 
heavy machinery elevations and power supplies. Normally, these power supplies are kept in a separate room for eliminating these uh, mechanical noises. And um, how can we ma minimize? And uh, also, the, uh, if you have observed in, the, in yesterday's demo, all the column is in the mounted uh, using air buffers for um, mounting the TM. And the walls of the room are insulated. And uh, of course, the best way of operating a machine is remote access because no one will be there and everything is fixed and no vibrations, or at least we can eliminate the vibrations. And uh, accessing the remote uh, uh, TM remotely is the best condition. So that's the reason why the, the machine which you are purchasing a new one is a completely remote access TM for obtaining a high spatial resolution. Next, airflow. Again, as a user, you can't do anything much, but uh, for information, air conditions should be avoided erratic uh, air movements. And uh, in the labs, in the TMs, in the LME, are be really very good for air conditioning system. There, are, there is no erratic movement of air. And water cooling system the, also can create some kind of disturbances for uh, working with, uh, with the high resolution images. And the power supplies, all the power supplies should be have a good help and need to be placed in a separate room. And EM interference. And as you have seen in yesterday's tour, there are a lot of EM cancellation systems available in our laboratory. So we are maintaining really very low uh, EM interference. We have problems with these EM uh, interferences. And um, that is a may one of the reason for uh, also the, that could be the one of the reason if you are not getting a good resolution in your images. So in conclusion, these are the words I would like to present. The, these are the words the, uh, from Ernest Ruska just after uh, getting the, receiving his uh, Nobel Prize. He mentioned that light microscope opened the first gate to mi microsomes. The alpha microscope opened the second gate to microsomes. And what will happen or what will, open the, what will happen if you open the third gate? This indicates that means uh, inventing the electron microscope is not the end of the world. With the stable um, uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, interferences and uh, development in the holders and uh, good vacuum systems available, there is a re really a lot of uh, uh, good room for innovation purposes. And uh, good instrumentation is a key for a good science. And uh, TM being a good uh, uh, combination of physics and engineering it's really a, a invisible uh, tool. Thank you. Thank you. I would like uh, it is a, to say it is really a good presentation and lecture. I want to ask a simple question regarding uh, the contamination. Uh, what is the effect of contamination of, uh, on the sample imaging? And second, you say that the contamination is due to the interaction of electron with carbon hydrogen. And from where the carbon hydrogen, is it in the sample or from where it come? Or in the air? Or? It could be from anywhere. Because if your sample is dirty, Mm -hmm. uh, means uh, if you have prepared a sample using tapes or something like that, and if you, you just immediately you have taken you have prepared the sample, yeah. and uh, they have a lot of uh, water vapor on the sample or some for any other reason, if it is not clean, if you put into the column, if it interacts with the electron beam, there the contamination will be there. Uh -huh. So it's a good way is just of, even though the sample is prepared just right away, good way is put it into the uh, plasma cleaner and then put it into the uh, TM uh, yeah, so if, uh, if the, suppose if there is nanoparticle and that is coated with organic, some I'm stabilized talking, organic sorry, things. Sorry, uh, I'm talking about the material science samples. Nanoparticles, you know, it's, yeah. it's really hard to clean. But of course, you can take some precautions such as maybe use a uh, clean uh, TM grids. Yeah, thank you.